the privilege to um, to interview and write reviews of uh, books of uh, Michael C. Keith, and I was particularly interested in uh, Michael C. Keith because he really wrote the textbook, a major textbook on radio. And when I was growing up, um, it, radio was very important. Uh, I listened to all the late night talk shows in New York, like Long John Neville, and they had all these eccentric characters on. And um, it was great. It was just it was something I was totally involved in. And to this day, even though radio is, uh, as Michael talked about, is sort of not, um, it's sort of dying out. Um, but to this day, I find it uh, fascinating and intimate and use your imagination rather than have a, you know, right in your face. But anyway, Michael C. Keith is a PhD, is the author of a co author of more than two dozen groundbreaking books on electronic media. Among them, Talking Radio, talk, Talking Radio, Voices in the Purple Haze, Radio Cultures, the classic uh, textbook, The Radio Station, later Keith's Radio Station, and Waves of Rancor, a book cited by President Clinton for its study of the radicals' right, rights use of uh, audio media. He's the author of the acclaimed memoir, The Next Better Place, and I used that for a number of years um, in my introduction to creative writing course, and those kids loved it. A young adult novel, Life is Falling Sideways, and 14 story collections. He's been nominated for numerous times for a Pushcart Prize, has been a finalist for both a National Indie Excellence Award for Short Fiction and the 2013 International Book Award in the Fiction Visionary Catalog. So, without further ado, Michael C. Keith. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Jeez. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad to be here. This is my second visit to Endicott College. Uh, I've had the privilege of uh, addressing Doug's class, uh, and it's always a pleasure to reconnect with Doug. As Doug has said, uh, uh, we've had contact through various books, and I've been on Doug's uh, uh, television show uh, a couple of times, and will be uh, uh, this coming January. Doug is ubiquitous. Uh, he, I think, uh, I, I, when I saw him today, I, I said, I feel like I just met you uh, a couple of days ago, but I haven't seen Doug in about a year because Doug is always involved in some literary activity in the greater metropolitan area of Boston, uh, which is uh, why he was a recipient of the Allen Ginsberg Award, uh, which is uh, is an award given for I someone. Feel like I should come up now. And speak yeah, well, that's a, the, the, this is my ploy. I'm going to get you up here. I'm going to sit down. But uh, it, it's an award given to someone who who makes great contributions to the literary community, and Doug has certainly uh, done that. Uh, so uh, Doug's asked me to talk a little bit about uh, my writing experience and my media experience and. And I'm not sure if we have any aspiring writers in this room. I think everybody's an aspiring writer, uh, whether they admit it or not, or they're closet writers. Uh, so I suspect uh, we have people who have done a little bit of something in here, and we probably have people who have published, uh, certainly, in, in this room. So I hope what I have to say has some interest uh, uh, to you. Uh, even if you're not uh, planning a career as, a, as the next great American storyteller. Uh, for me, um, I think uh, uh, the desire to write uh, was right there when I was a kid. I don't think I knew it at the time, uh, uh, and I don't think I knew it until years and years later when my mother, after I had published, uh, some books said, oh, you know, you, you always wrote. And I said, what? She said, oh, yeah, when you were just a little kid. Said, and then, you know, how mothers are wont to do, she starts bringing stuff up from your childhood, generally at, you know, holiday gatherings when you just assume not have her bring up things about your childhood. But she said, yeah, yeah, when you were nine or ten years old, you were writing cowboy books. And I said, oh, I was? She said, oh, yeah. She says, you wrote a wonderful cowboy book uh, about this uh, uh, cowboy with blonde hair and blue eyes and a big white Stetson cap. And uh, I love that story. And I still have it, she said. 
and uh, this is, uh, uh, it's one of my one of my treasures. And I thought, well, that, that you know that's interesting, um, and uh, uh, but I didn't think too much of that. But I found myself when I was in my teens, as a lot of people do when they're in their teens and they're starting to experience. Uh, the things of life, the emotions of life, and maybe starting to feel things a little more intensely, I've, uh, I started scribbling what I thought were poems, what, what a, uh, a poet master like Doug would not qualify as poetry, but I was giving it a shot, and of course way back in the day, uh, to, to those of us who knew nothing of poetry, we felt, well, everything must rhyme. And absolutely, you yeah, know, I concept of blank verse or haiku or any of that, or that stuff. But I did. I wrote uh, some things, and I actually ventured into experimental areas of doing things, and and I I put together a little book, a self-made book. You know, I uh, this was back in the day where you didn't have these uh, computer printers. Hell, you didn't have computers back in those days. Uh, and so I put together this little uh, book, which had a little brown cover on, stapled the, the side, maybe had about 30 pages in it, called Fragments in the Dust, uh, and uh, put it in a couple of stores on consignment. Of course, nobody ever bought it, and, and, and I never went back because I knew nobody would ever buy the darn thing and whatnot. And so I think it was there, there you know, a little germ, a little sense of maybe what you might be doing in the future. Years went by and, and uh, I had a bizarre childhood uh, which I don't know if anybody in here in, in Doug's class had read uh, my memoir The Next Better Place and uh, I spent uh, 12 years uh, bumming around the country as we called it with my alcoholic father hitchhiking back and forth coast to coast seldom if ever going to school uh, and it was a crazy, crazy time. But at 17, I, I just decided I've got to get away from this alcoholic father to find my own way in life. And so I convinced him to sign me into the Army. Uh, my timing wasn't especially great since it was during the Vietnam War, but he signed me in and I went in the Army and I went to Asia and uh, uh, came back, fortunately. And when I did come back, it, I was very much determined to go to college. I had to go to college, right? Even though I didn't finish high school. You know, I like to say I'm one of the uh, one of those few people in the world who is a high school dropout as a freshman with a PhD. You know, so but you do need high school. And when I was over in Korea they uh, uh, insisted that we all get our high school equivalency diploma, the GED. So I got it when I was over there. And I came back, I'm gonna go to college, you know. I wanna make something of myself. I, I don't wanna be like my father, this, this character who never kept a job and you know, was a chronic drinker and didn't provide for any of us and whatnot. <clears throat> I don't know if anybody ever read Angela's Ashes in here or saw the movie, okay. Um, uh, something I think you should see. Even if you don't want to be a writer, that's a good movie. Uh, so I came back, <clears throat> found a school that would take me, uh, which happened to be Miami Dade Community College. Uh, and I went there uh, as a business major, and, but taking English courses, and I had a professor there. You know, you always have one professor who kind of has a tremendous influence on you, maybe even changes the direction of your life, and she did. Uh, she saw something that I didn't in that class, and she said, you're a business major? She says, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're dropping that. You're going to be an English major. And I, it didn't matter that much to me, so I became an English major. And, uh, uh, and ended up uh, at that school getting an associate degree in English, uh, and then went on and got a bachelor's degree in English. But uh, I also went to a radio school. Uh, in Boston, it was one of these, you two can be a DJ, sort of thing. Uh, this was Northeast Broadcasting School, right? And, uh, and so I went there and I got my first radio job up in Hanover, New Hampshire, uh, and ended up spending uh, a decade 
in radio in various jobs as DJ, announcer, producer, newsman, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, pretty much just worked my way right out of that profession and went back to college, decided I wanted to go back to college because uh, somebody said, you know, you can go to college and since you're a veteran, they'll pay you to go to college. And I thought, wow, I can go to college and get paid like I have a part-time job. I like that. So I, I worked in radio, but I started taking courses at night, two or three courses. The more courses you took, the more money they paid you, right? That was the incentive. So at times, I was taking three courses a semester, right? And before I knew it, I had enough credits for a bachelor's degree. And so I, I got the degree, but I hadn't exhausted the money. So I thought, well, hell, I want to keep this part-time job. I'll go in the master's program. Uh, uh, which I did. Um, and then finally, with the master's degree, I got a job as a professor at Dean College. It's a small college southwest of Boston. And I stayed there for 12 years uh, and became the director of the communications program at, at Dean uh, College. And it was during that time I decided to start to write academic books. You know, because it seemed to me that uh, it would be a good way to keep my job. And if I ever wanted to leave this community college to go to a four-year college, it might help, uh, even though I didn't have the PhD at the time. So I, I wrote one little book uh, called Production and Format Radio, which was uh, a book that had to do with how do you sculpt uh, television, uh, radio commercials based on uh, a format. In other words, every station has a format, top 40, classical, country, and each of them do commercials in their own specific way to, uh, uh, to sound like they fit within that format. It was called Match Flow. And I had been a producer uh, at a radio station for a number of years producing commercials, sometimes 20 and 30 a day. So I wrote this little book and uh, sent it to University Press of America, which was one of those quasi-shared uh, publishing enterprises. You really had to make the book type ready or, or press ready. But after that, they took it over. You didn't have to buy any copies or whatnot. They published it. So they published it, and it was my first college textbook. And, I, and it whet my appetite. I thought, ooh, this, this went pretty well. Uh, so I have another idea for a college text that had to do with uh, radio station operations. And the reason I had this idea was because the books that I saw to adopt for that course, I just thought were so out of date and irrelevant. I'd spent 12 years in radio and all facets of it, and this book just, just was dealing with things that were relevant 30 years before. And it was the leading textbook of the time. It was Robert Hilliard's Introduction to the Sound Medium. And, and it, it was the number one book. And I, I thought, well, let me write my own. And uh, I did. And it became known as the Radio Station. Uh, and it was published by uh, Focal Press, Butterworth Focal Press, which was a large textbook house. Within... Uh, Within six months, it was that publisher's best-selling book. And within a year, it was the most widely adopted book on, on its topic in America. It obliterated that other book. That other book ceased to exist after this book came out. The irony is the author of that particular book would later, go, uh, later would become my co-author on 12 other books. And to this day, a dear friend. And he never held it against me that my book killed his book. He's just not that kind of person. In any event, uh, the radio station became this, this huge adoption text at 100, 125 different colleges around, uh, around the country. So it's actually making a few bucks off of it, around 10,000 bucks extra a year uh, for almost 30 years. That's $300,000. It would be nice to get it all in one lump sum rather than a check for nine or $10,000 a year, but you don't look a gift horse in the mouth. That, that was fine. In any event, after eight editions of that book, almost 30 years, I decided 
I that's it. I don't want to do this thing anymore. And in addition to that book, I did six other textbooks on various areas in media and leading up to a history book of broadcasting. And I was at my wit's end doing textbooks. You know, it had been a great way to kind of get into print, uh, to make a few dollars, to gain credibility as an academic, you know, which uh, all of those things happened. But uh, uh, enough is enough. I had just finally gotten to the point I didn't want to do it. And I didn't want to do the ninth edition of the radio station. So uh, the publisher says, oh, no, but we want you to continue with this. And I said, yeah, but adoptions are declining because, unfortunately, radio's audiences are declining and universities and colleges are really not teaching radio-only courses anymore. They might incorporate those into mass media uh, courses or broad, just general broadcasting courses per se, which I think is a mistake because radio is still incredibly vital. It, re it, re it really is. And would you believe it? It is still during certain hours of the day the most used electronic mass medium in the world. Still. You know, but you, you hear all of these uh, things about how radio's dying, and it's like uh, Mark Twain's alleged quote, uh, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Radio is still very, very much alive. In any event, the publisher didn't want to let the book go, and I said, well, get someone else to, to co-author it, and I found a couple of people, and they were great academics, and they had radio backgrounds, and they decided, oh, yes, we'll do it. But the publisher said, but your name has to stay on it. I was flattered because they said, we're going to put your name in the title of the book, which is now called Keith's Radio Station. This ponderous 500-page book is the current book on radio, which is still the most widely used book on the subject in, 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 in the country. The book did go on to be used around the world. In fact, I, I lectured at Moscow State University, at Navarre University in Spain, all over the place because they actually used this book in translation in their courses. So, uh, so yeah, that was good. That, that was good. The other, the other uh, textbooks had nowhere near the sales of, of this. Uh, wonderful if they had, but they didn't. If they had, I could have retired. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, I uh, finally got to the point where I was tired of writing textbooks uh, and uh, decided, you know, I'd like to write books that, 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 that uh, uh, embrace issues, issues in media, you know, like the fake news thing that we hear, hear about. I didn't do a book on fake news. But, you know, books that deal with uh, discrimination in media. I did a, 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 a book on how Native Americans utilized, utilized radio to overcome uh, you know, the prejudice against him. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 it was the first book of its kind, and to this day, there's been no other book on the subject. A year ago, I was invited to the Library of Congress to talk about how Native Americans have utilized radio on their reservations to address a lot of their issues. We did a book on gays and lesbians in media. Uh, we did a book on, or I, I did a book on uh, counterculture radio, underground radio called Voices in the Purple Haze, bunches of what are called monographs. Monographs are devoted to a single subject. They tend to be academic, but it was something you could sink your teeth into. It wasn't a textbook. And I did uh, six, seven, eight uh, of, of those books. Now, all along uh, this period where I was an academic, I've been an academic for 39 years and did all of these academic books. In the back of my mind, uh, you know, I thought, I had such a, a, a very bizarre childhood. I would love to write uh, something about it. I'd like to write a memoir about my life on the road with an alcoholic father and our incidents and things that, that we encountered and whatnot. So, you know, in my spare time, I'd sit down 
and, and was determined, I'm going to write this thing out, and I'd write so much of it and put it aside, and then I'd write it all out, and then I decided, no, maybe it would be better if I just wrote it as a screenplay. I wrote it as a screenplay, and then I said, no, I, that, that's never going to go anywhere, and I wrote it again and again and again, probably over the course of seven or eight years. And, uh, uh, and then ended up with like a 320 page manuscript uh, and started sending it out unsolicited, which meant it would go in the slush file of lowly assistant to the assistant, assistant editor, that sort of thing. And uh, you know, uh, you'd end up getting a little postcard back saying, sorry, we, we can't do this, we can't do this, and whatnot. And it was very discouraging. And then, uh, and then I thought, you know, what, what you need is an agent, right? But the thing is, an agent doesn't want to take you on if you haven't done anything. And, the, and people say, well, look at all the books you wrote. You wrote 20, 25 academic books. Well, uh, you know, mainstream agents don't care about your academic books. They want to know what you've done with mainstream general audience books, it, you know, it doesn't mean much to them. They want to see a record of commercial successes. So, of course, you know, I got uh, letters back from the agents saying, no, you know, we just, we don't think we can handle this. And it was just very discouraging. Fortunately, I was having a successful career as an academic, and uh, my publishing resulted in my be, becoming the most prominent person in the nation in the field of radio studies. And I got lifetime achievement awards in those areas by the biggest organizations and, and so on. So that was good. So I had this. I wasn't, quote, that person who determined, I'm going to be a professional writer, that's all I'm going to do, and I'll wash dishes and wait tables until this happens. Never did that. You know, uh, I, I, I was determined to have some kind of success in life that my father didn't have, so I had a, I had a profession, and I, and I worked at this, but the sideline was, was writing uh, 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 this, this memoir beyond the, uh, the, uh, the academic books. Uh, and then I had a little bit of, a couple of epiphanies uh, a few years ago. I was walking across my campus at Boston College, uh, and walking through the library, and I had just read, I'm a voracious reader of memoirs and biographies and autobiographies. I love them. I just constantly read them. I read more about the authors than I read what they write. Sometimes I read the authors and never even read what they write. I'm just fascinated with the, with the creative person. That's a fascination. And I walk through the library, and all of a sudden I thought, you know something? On your memoir manuscript, you have a prologue and an epilogue. You have a, you know, you have like a 15-page prologue and, an, and a 30-page epilogue, because what you're trying to do in this memoir is you're trying to tell the story of your entire life with the center of the book about your, your 12 years on the road from the age of 5 until 12, with, uh, age of 5 until 17, with your alcoholic father. And I thought, that's the problem. Dump the prologue, dump the epilogue, you've got the book. It's right in the middle. 290 pages of the book, it's right there. I went home, I just took those, the prologue and the epilogue right out of there, and I looked at it, and the thing stood on its own. It needed nothing. It started with this little kid, me, five years old, running a scooter through the park in front of the state capitol of New York State, Albany, New York, while my two parents are off to the side negotiating a transfer of me to my father. And you hear the conversation between the mother and the father, the level of desperation, and you hear what the kid is thinking about them. And that's how that opened up. And then from there, it just launches into 18 months of the father and the son on the road, compressed from 12 years to 18 months. All of the key events that took place in 12 years, I condensed into 18 months for dramatic purposes, for dramatic reasons, for, you know, to have a real uh, flowing, exciting, dramatic plot. And so I sent that out. Right, 
and started getting rejections back again. I also, at the, at the same time, had an idea for the title of the book, which I thought, oh my god, what a title. The Dream of Motion. I just fell in love with that, you know, because that's what this kid has. I loved it. For those 12 years, I loved just being out because it was a Huck Finn existence. I didn't have to go to school, didn't have to take showers, didn't have to go to bed. My father didn't give a damn about any of that stuff. We were just out there, and he and I, even though he was completely irresponsible, we were having fun. He became more of a friend of mine than he did a father, you know. And uh, so I love that title. So, and then along the way of getting these rejections, I almost got to the point where I thought, oh, forget about it. A friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, who was a nationally known radio news person on NPR, Corey Flintoff, who I'd gone to school with. I knew him when we were 15 years old. I was in touch with him, and, I, and, and he says, you know what, I've got a, a novel at an agency. A, a, and I said, well, that's great, that's great. And then I went, wait a second. I said, Corey, do you mind if I use your name as an introduction? And I send this in saying, my friend Corey Flintoff suggested I send this to you. And he said, of course not. Please do it. You know? So I did. I a cover letter and the manuscript that I sent it to the agency. And I said, well, this, this might be good. Yeah. Weeks went by. Months went by. And, and a couple of months went by. And then finally I thought, that's it. I've done everything possible. I shouldn't worry about it anymore. I did what I needed to do. Maybe I'll just send it to a printer. I'll get copies made up so I can give members of my family and friends. It'll be a record, and that's, that, that's enough. And then I got really kind of pissed off at the agency. I thought, you know, come on, have, have the, the decency to at least uh, respond by saying, this is not something we're interested in. In deference to Corey Flintoff, who's who's a client of yours, and so I I got on the damn phone. I was going to raise hell. I was going to just tell them off. I said, "What do I have to lose?" So I got right on the phone, the reception and answer, and I said, "Can I speak to blah blah whoever it was the head of the agency?" And they said, "Would you hold on a moment? Who are you, please?" I said, "Michael Keith." And then I waited for two minutes and so, and then a, a woman answered the phone, and I thought, "Oh God, now I'm being put through, you know, the maze of stuff here." And she says, "Michael, listen, this is Christy Cardenas. I'm senior agent here, and we love your book." And I'm going, "You love my book? When the hell were you planning to tell me this? You know, maybe in three years from now?" Yeah. But I, ah, I was like. Uh, you, you do. He says, yes, and we'd love to handle you. And I was like, oh my God, oh whoopee days, you know. So I was thrilled to death, and, and they, said, uh, they said a couple other things, and they said, so we are going to start sending it out. Here's how we do it. We send, we send it to four publishers, and we give them a 30-day a, a window in which they must respond, or we withdraw it from them. And we were going to send it to Random House, Knopf, da 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 da. And they did. And they didn't send it to a lowly assistant editor. They sent it to the publisher because the head of this agency was well known in New York. He knew everybody. So when I got rejection letters from them, I got rejection letters from the likes of Mike Corda, who is the publisher of Random House. And, you know, and and sure enough started getting rejection letters from all of these top people at these agencies saying, this is wonderful book. We just don't know how we place in our catalog or we have another book, another memoir, and we think that we, we don't want to, this sort of thing. And I got a dozen more rejections to the point where the agent at the agency, Christy Cardenas, said, Jokingly, she said, you know something, if it's any consolation, you've gotten the best rejection letters of any author we've ever had here. I said, good, that and $3 will get me a Starbucks coffee. Not going to do me any good. Got a few more rejections, and then finally I'm thinking, that's it. How much more can I do? I've done it all. I've tried my best, 
and I feel good about that. I'd feel a lot better if I found a home. I feel good about that, and that's what I'll do. I'll just make copies, give it to my family, because I think there's an important story here to tell. And even my own immediate family didn't know the details of that 12 years on the road. So a couple of weeks went by, <clears throat> telephone rings, Christy Cardenas from the agency calls up and she says, we have a nibble. A nibble? She says, yes, it's from an extremely prestigious house, Algonquin Books. And they're interested in your book, but they have an issue with it. Uh, it's Friday, uh, they'll call you Monday. Uh, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I've got to wait on this over the weekend. I'll be tortured. This will drive me mad. And I'm thinking, what is it? What is it? Monday, the executive acquisition editor called up and, and, and said, uh, was very sweet, very friendly lady, uh, Amy Gash, and uh, said, we, I love your book. I love your book. I have a kid the age of your character in this book. And I'm thinking, there's there was the relationship. There's how she connected to this kid, this 12-year-old kid in the book. She says, but, but you need a hook. You need a hook. Two-thirds of the way in the book, you need a hook to gratify the reader and to give them a reason for uh, to go the rest of the way and for why they read up to that point. You need a hook, right? And she says, and if, if you're willing to do that, we're willing to publish your book. And I said, oh yeah, not a problem. As we're talking, I know what the hook is in my head. I knew it as we're talking. She says, so when you do it, please send it in, right? I was elated. I hung up the phone, half an hour later, I, re I, I wrote the hook right into it. Right on the page, I didn't even have to mess with the, it just put it right in there. The next day I sent it to her and she was flabbergasted. She said, this is fine. This is fine. We'll send you a contract. Well, we'll send your agent a contract, right? So then the agent contacts me and says, "Okay, right." Now they're feeling cocky about this. So he says, "Yeah, but we're going to tell them we want fifty thousand dollars if they want your book." And I'm thinking, "Oh God, don't screw up this deal. I'll do the goddamn thing for no advance at all. I'll be very and just. This is Algonquin, right?" And. Uh, so they went back to Algonquin, and Algonquin balked about it, you know, and finally they came back. They said, we'll give him $15,000 if he's willing to sign with us. And, and I said, yeah, oh yeah, I'm willing to sign with you. So anyway, to make sure, uh, a long story short, and I don't know what kind of time I have. You're watching? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's 1 o'clock? you got an hour. That's one thirty. yeah. Okay, good. Uh, because I hope we can have a little Q&A here, too. I really do. I rely on that. Anyway, so, uh, and if you do have a burning question while I'm talking, I'll let it tell you. So, okay, I do have a burning question. What was the hook? Oh, okay. She said that you're telling a story about how you, you're out on the road with your father, and the promised land is California, and you get stalled all along the way because your old man, your father, is drinking, he runs out of money, you have to wait until he drums up some money working menial jobs, and you're months and months and months on the road, right? And you finally get there, and you're in California, and it turns out it's the same old thing, you know? The whole idea of the promised land, he's still getting drunk, you're living in a flea bag place, and you're disillusioned. You know, you're just very disillusioned by it. And the hook was the kid finally has this epiphany where it's all bogus, where his father is just full of bull and and, and he's and he's done with it. He wants to go back home. And the trip is reversed. And, and they head back east, and that was that was the hook. As subtle, as mild as it was, it was this recognition in the main character that he'd been dreaming all along, and the reality was the reality of this. Okay, so uh, so anyway, <clears throat> uh, uh, we went into production, uh, and then the the publisher said, you know, your title. Uh, can you hear me back there when I'm off mic? Yeah, I've got one of those voices. Uh, 
the title was uh, that I had was The Dream of Motion. I just thought, how poetic can you get? Isn't this poetic? The Dream of Motion, right? And the, and the acquisitions editor said, you know, we're not crazy about that title because we think it sounds like a runner's manual. You know, for a jogger, a runner, the dream of motion. Of course, I didn't see it that way at all. And she said, you know, you have a phrase in the book which we think would be better for it. And I said, yeah, what's that? And she said, the next better place. You talk about you guys are always looking for the next better place, you know? And I thought, that sounds really kind of prosaic and unpoetic and unexciting, you know? But I wasn't about to argue with her, you know? Uh, you don't want to argue with someone who has, who has made your dream essentially come true. So it became the next better place rather than the dream of motion. That, fine and dandy. So over the next eight, nine months, the book went into production. And interestingly enough, uh, they, they uh, didn't change one sentence in the book. Nothing, nothing was changed. There were a few commas here and there. The book was untouched. The way, she, the way they got it, they said it's, it's written perfect. You know, and I was very flattered about that. And so it went very, very smoothly. And, and uh, uh, they got, um, <clears throat> oh, you can't see it too well on this. Uh, they decided to use a picture of me when I was 10 years old, uh, uh, standing on the highway, hitchhiking. And this is the paperback version, not the, uh, uh, not the hardcover version. This little picture, which you can barely see here anyway, uh, was the full picture on the hardcover of, of the book. But this is the paperback version of the book. And uh, then they sent it out for uh, blurbs, as Doug was, uh, as we were talking about. I bagged Doug for a blurb on my next book. I'm very generous about it. <coughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, so they, they sent them out, and they got some good blurbs. I don't know if you ever heard of the book uh, Running With Scissors. It was made into a movie. Uh, and uh, Augustine Burroughs did it, and he fell in love with the book, so he, he wrote a book saying this is a uh, blurb, saying this is a beautiful book, and got a lot of other uh, people to write a blurb, including Larry King, uh, and some very, very prominent people uh, wrote blurbs, and so went into production, and uh, it came out as a hardcover book, right? Uh, the book debuted the very week that we invaded Iraq for the first time. That invasion literally killed sales at bookstores. People weren't going in and buying novels or books in bookstores during that week that we invaded Iraq. There was a lot of distraction. People weren't thinking about this, and this lasted for a few weeks. It was anathema. It was really a curse on uh, any book that came out during uh, that <clears throat> during that period, so sales were modest. But the book went on to be reviewed in 30 venues across the United States, uh, in, even including Entertainment Weekly, Vogue, L Magazine, uh, and and of course the traditional Publishers Weekly and and whatnot, with rave reviews. Got Great reviews all over the place. Uh, uh, you couldn't you couldn't ask for anything better. Uh, it was viewed in the Denver Post and and uh, Newsday and and uh, St. Louis uh, Dispatch I think uh, named it uh, one of their book of the year. As a matter of fact, ten best books of the year. And the Washington Post reviewed it and hated it. You know, the reviewer reviewed three books simultaneously like the other two did not like my book. And it being down in Washington, right near NPR, it really kind of screwed my chances of getting uh, uh, on an NPR book show in Terry Gross. You know, 29 great reviews, one negative review, and it can really screw things up for you. But so be it, you know, uh, you can't, uh, you know, you, you have to uh, appreciate the blessings you get you can, but you know something, I think you've heard it said before, authors spend more time lamenting bad reviews than celebrating good reviews. It's just, you know, it's just the way it is. But that's fine, so the book uh, 
uh, uh, and then uh, it was sold as a book on tape uh, and they asked me to do the, the narrative of the book and I declined uh, for two reasons. First of all, I, they were only offering me $3,000 to do it and I thought that was a paltry sum to sit there for four days in a New York studio reading this book that I was so kind of bored with at that point. And so I said no, but they got, I don't know, uh, they, they got the guy who did the uh, Lance Armstrong book, It's Not About the Bike, uh, which was a number one bestseller. He did the book on tape. I've never listened to it. I listened to like the first 10 minutes and decided I didn't like his voice, so I never listened to the, I never listened to it, and that's fine. And then they uh, were looking to sell the paperback rights to the book, and they got a couple of weak offers from a couple of paperback houses. So they decided that they would publish it themselves as a paperback, and that was good. And then they sold it to a, a British publisher that put it out, uh, and, and that was kind of the, the, the path of the book. Uh, it uh, stayed in print for about six, seven years, and then went out of print. But it went out of print at a time when e-books uh, uh, where Kindles were coming in and they, they asked me, D -d can we put your book into a Kindle and it'll be there forever. And I said, hell yes. So now I get whopping $40 checks for Kindle sales on the book. And so the book is available uh, on Kindle. And then one thing I discovered is there's always a great, when you go on Amazon, maybe you guys do it, you go on Amazon to buy a book, used books, right? Never, well, I shouldn't say that as these authors. We'd like you to buy the new book because we get the royalties. We don't get crap on the used books, right? But that's all I buy now are used books. I mean, when there's a book that it's eighteen dollars, but you buy it for two dollars used, and you buy it and it comes to you and it's new. It's like brand new. I'm thinking, oh my god, you know. So there's tons and tons of the next better place as used books if you're interested. Okay, two, three bucks, right? And, uh, and so it, it, it exists, it lives. Every so, now this is 12, 14 years ago, right? Uh, it doesn't seem that long ago. But every so often I get a fan letter on the book from somebody in, in Boise, Iowa or whatnot, uh, talking about how uh, they love the, the book and, and, and then people will make comments on Amazon, you know, the little reviews. The one I liked the best was somebody said, this is a long forgotten masterpiece. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir, you know. So the books, you know, Doug would know this, he's published a lot of books. <coughs> they live on, they live on way beyond, way beyond what we'll live on. You know, they, they're, they're, they really are there forever. As it turns out, the, uh, library in my hometown, Easton, the Ames Free Library, which is a gorgeous library. And in fact, it's been uh, awarded the number one uh, small uh, region or regional library in America, three years running. Uh, it's like a community center. They have what is known as One Book, One Community. I don't know if you've heard of that. And they chose this for 2018, One Book, One Community. Uh, the Next Better Place, along with a couple other uh, memoirs. So these things just kind of uh, go on and on and on, yes? You've got over 100 reviews on Goodreads. See, and I never go to Goodreads. That's good to know. 100 reviews, that's not bad. You've got five stars. Hey, I like it. I like it. I'm feeling better already. So in a way, you have to be in a sort of ironic way. You know, uh, oh, don't leave mad. <laughs> oh, okay, that, that's acceptable then. Uh, yeah, uh, I had uh, uh, a lot of resentment toward my father for a long, 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 long time, you know. But as I get older, I look back and I think, you know, he, he really, I think, uh, is responsible in some bizarre, strange way for what success I've had because he kind of presented me with the anti-father. <laughs> that is to say, the father you don't want to be. He was a great anti-role uh, model. 
On the other hand, he, he wasn't cruel. He was always incredibly affectionate. Uh, you know, very, but he just didn't know how to uh, provide a normal childhood for a kid. He just didn't know how, you know, yes. Did he live long enough to see your success in either academia or? He, yeah, he, he lived long enough to see that I became a college professor. And, and I don't think he ever wrapped his mind around that. I, I always thought he thought that was almost kind of funny, you know. That, uh, uh, that knowing where I came from, that I'd now be a, a college professor. But I think in his own way, he was, he was kind of impressed by it. Uh, my mother, on the other hand, who uh, was left in the lurch by me as I went off all the time. I mean, uh, you know, the, the routine was uh, I would be with her for a few months, and then my father would coax me to go someplace with him, I'd go someplace with him, we'd disappear. And she wouldn't hear from me for six months or a year, right? And then after maybe a year and a half, I'd come back and I'd stay with her and she'd think, I have him back, we'll give him a normal childhood. And then after a few months, my father would show up on the scene again. And by that time, I was thinking, well, living with my mother, I have to go to school, we have to go to bed at a certain time, we have to have a bath once a week, which was the thing back then. And with my with my father, we just go out and we just hang, we just travel, no responsibilities. And I would go off with him and be gone years again and, and, and whatnot. So she was really the victim, and she was really put through a heck of a lot of stuff. Uh, I later on heard that you know life was very bad for her because one of her kids, uh, she didn't know. She didn't know where he was, if he was alive, if he was okay, what, you know, if he was eating, and so on and so forth. Later in life, you know, when I became a, an adult, I was around and, and she, saw, she saw everything. She saw the publication of this book. Now, I was reluctant to have her read this book because in this book I was very frank and in the opening chapter, I, as a kid, I say, I feel my mother is giving me away. You know? And I thought that'll hurt her. She'll, she'll be very hurt about this. So I said to her, I said, you know, you know about my life. Don't, don't, you don't have to read that book. You know about it. And then one day I was at her house and she said, I read your book. And I'm like, oh God, what have we got going here? And she just uh, kind of looked at me and she said, yeah, she said, um, you're a good writer, and that's the only thing she ever said, ever again, never brought it up again. I never felt that she held anything in, because I think she felt in her own heart that maybe she had. Maybe she had just given up too easy when I said I wanted to go with my father. She believed my father when he said, we'll just stay around locally and you'll see him all the time. I think in her own mind, she knew that that, that was unlikely, but yet she still because she was alone with my two sisters trying to support them. She got nothing from my father. She, she had a low paying waitress job. And so the idea that maybe my father might help out with me, you know, she, she took the chance and the chance didn't work out too well for her. You know. So in any, in, in any event, in any event uh, going back uh, to the progression of writing, uh, this was in like 2002, and I published this book, and I was very gratified by it, and uh, kind of forgot about the writing thing for a while, because by then I'd written 15 or 16 academic books, I had written the, uh, the memoir, and I thought, well, that's fine. I've done all I need to do. I don't have to worry about it anymore, uh, and, uh, but, Having the writer thing in you, and it's, I think it's in your DNA, you just don't abandon it. You may go on hiatus for a while and, forget, and not do much, but then within a year, year and a half later, I wrote a novel, and it was a young adult novel called Life is Falling Sideways. And a friend of mine had a small imprint called Parlance, my co-author on the, on the textbooks, because he had written a few uh, novels, and he wanted to publish them, so he created this this publishing imprint. And I said, okay, take it, uh, yeah. And, and so it was published through Parlance. And, 
and uh, you know appeared on Amazon, but you know, just uh, went nowhere. And then I and then I handed it to uh, Algonquin, and Algonquin said, "Well, we love the writing, but you know." It, it, it's it's hard to classify. It seems as much of, of an adult book as it appears a young adult book, and so we don't really know how to place it. We don't know what to do with it. And I said, well, that's fine. Maybe I'll do it as an adult book or as strictly a young adult book. But what I did is I just put it on the shelf and never did anything with it. Figuring, okay. And it was probably two or three years after that that I started writing short stories and. Uh, and for the last eight, nine, ten years, that's what I've done. I've written seven, six, seven hundred short stories, and most of which have appeared in uh, small press books. Uh, this is the latest one, Perspective, Dressed Like a Log in a River. It was published by Palmar Books in Berlin, Germany. It's in English. Uh, and uh, published with presses that Doug is very familiar with and has published with them. Uh, likewise, uh, and it's been gratifying, and it's and, and I've been very happy with it. But it's been more like an avocation, you know. It's been more like a hobby. My, this year, I I retired from Boston College after nearly a quarter of a century, and I still teach a course there. But I continue to write short stories and continue to to produce collections. I have. Uh, two new uh, collections coming out, one in 2018, one in 2019, and I'll be starting a novella, a novel, uh, after Christmas, and that's kind of where I am as a writer, okay? So, anybody have any questions? I've been up here blabbing for, mm, the better part of an hour, almost an hour, right? Uh, so, if anybody has any questions, I'd be pleased to entertain them. See that, I inspire a lot of questions, yes. If you could talk a, a bit more about, or, or just talk a little bit about the, the current kind of media landscape and oh, okay. you know, things you feel positive about or concerned about or. Uh, All right, uh, we could start with radio because uh, that's where I made my reputation as an academic, radio. I spent 12 years as a radio guy in, in radio stations uh, from Boston to Miami to Hartford in Providence and uh, um, uh, and enjoyed being in radio and liked pretty much what I, I did. Uh, today, uh, radio is in a cock quandary. Uh, it's lost the overwhelming bulk of its young music listeners. Uh, you know, they don't listen to radio for music anymore, not with iPods and MP3s and, and, and streaming and downloading. That's hurt radio phenomenally so. Um, uh, what really hurt radio was the uh, uh, Telecom Act of 1997 uh, when it allowed uh, big companies to swoop in and cluster stations and just uh, threw out the idea of independent creative uh, programming mm -hmm. and at the worst possible time. And uh, so radio, uh, Radio is on the cusp of a total redefinition. Uh, it's never going to be what it was before. Uh, when radio had its major crises when TV came along, it reinvented itself in a format that, was, that had a market. There's no format that it can reinvent itself in now that would have a market. Radio must play commercials in order to exist. Young people listening to music don't want to hear commercials. They don't have to anymore. You know, they have their libraries on their i on, on their iPods of 3,000 tracks of music. They don't have to listen to radio anymore. So radio has been reduced to a talk venue, uh, which is pretty redundant. Uh, there's more stations that, that can make a living out there. So we're losing hundreds of stations every year. You know, we reached an all-time high of about 15,000 stations uh, 20, 25 years ago, and that's down by 3,000 stations already. Yeah. And uh, it's not that radio is going to disappear; it's just going to be one more shop on on the audio mall. Uh, there's just going to be all of these other other services, and there's going to be radio. And if radio has a decent product, it will have a following. 
there are legacy stations in this country which will continue to, to exist. But the overwhelming majority of radio stations, uh, I really believe, in, in the coming years, are going to go silent. Okay. It's going to go silent. <coughs> so it's not a very positive, optimistic yeah. uh, prediction about uh, radio uh, in its old traditional broadcast over the air form. You know, you, you, you were about late night radio. Yeah. Uh, I always was fascinated by, by late night radio. It's sort of like an underground type sensibility there. Can you talk about uh, a bit about uh, uh, the late night radio? Yeah. yeah, I wrote a book called yeah, Sounds in the yeah. Dark uh, about all night radio, and I think that is a genre of, of radio that there'll always be an audience for because there are people who are up all night or insomniacs or third shift workers. We live in a 24-7 society now where, where if you're on the Southeast Expressway at 2 in the morning, you're bumper to bumper, you know. So there's, there's a built-in captive audience for it. And you know something? Late night radio has always been a zone where a little more freedom, a little more creativity was allowed, which is what really is what radio needs. It needs to bring back the local flavor, the unique personality, and the unusual topic. It's content, content, content. It's so much less about technology than it is about content. You know, if you've got good content, people will find you, and it doesn't matter where the hell you are, people are going to find you. But radio really uh, was asleep at the wheel, and it just kind of quit doing really creative stuff. It was just redundant. It was just 10 of the same formats in the same market, and people got tired of it. It's much like what happened in network television, you know, when finally uh, cable uh, stations came along. And now the most creative television is from is from cable, from the you know from uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu and, and and HBO. That's where the great content is, and that's killing network television. That's another thing, uh, who's who, who I think has a very very threatened future. The networks are not going to be around, you know, 10, 20 years from now. They're going to be another store on that, that infinite video mall. Uh, they can't continue to exist the way they're existing. And the evening newscasts are, uh, I mean, almost all but gone. So conventional, traditional, long, long ago media uh, uh, is either uh, uh, faced with making substantial content changes or just withering on the vine. People don't care anymore. I, I go into my classroom, as I'm sure you do, and I, I have 20 students in there. I say, okay, how many of you are listening to music radio? Not one hand. Not one hand. 10 years ago, I got two or three people. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, everybody in the room raised their hand. What does it say? What does it say that when radio's number one product, and, and you know, after the arrival of television has been music, but now young people aren't, aren't tuning it in. It means it's dying. What's it going to do? How is it going to recover? There'll be radio stations that are highly local and dependable because of that, and then some that are really avant-garde in terms of experimentation and creativity and doing new and different things that will be out there. But the old line stations uh, that are playing uh, 1980s music they're not, they're not going to be able to keep the lights on because they're not going to have advertising income. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you for sitting here.